Okay, well, if I don't mind patting myself on my back, I, I sure did a good job on that intro. I really like that. That was my very first attempt at a, you know, video opening. Um, now, if you recall, uh, last time I was talking about these uh, new brochures from Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, the Beyond Misinformation, and uh, we're going to be giving some of those away on the show today. Um, but I'm going to start out right away with this clip that kind of caught my eye. It's not very often that you, you see something like this. It was the CIA busts a Fox News reporter for pretending to be a CIA member. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and play this. It's only two minutes. I'll be right back and tell you how to win one of these. Fair and balanced, that's Fox News Channel's slogan in the United States, of course. Like any media outlet, the network likes its viewers to know it's delivering news and opinion from the most credible sources, a principle that's been rocked then by the latest revelation. We were just in a very spirited discussion with former CIA operative Wayne Simmons. Wayne Simmons says this is smart security. He's a former CIA operative. But former CIA operative Wayne Simmons says nothing could be further from the truth, and he should know. You see, Wayne has done interrogations. As you said, I've done many, many, many interrogations, and I can tell you from having worked with the very, very best. I worked against the narco terrorists for years. Thank you very much, Wayne Simmons. Good seeing you again. Always a pleasure, Neil. Simmons claimed to have worked for the CIA from 1973 to 2000. He used that false claim in an attempt to obtain government security clearances and work as a defense contractor, including, at one point, successfully getting deployed overseas as an intelligence advisor to senior military personnel. I imagine he said, I was under such cover that they're going to disown me. So if you ask the CIA if I really work there, no, they're going to say, I've never heard of him, never heard of him. That's how secret my mission was. <laughs> you know? I mean, gullibility, I've never seen it at this, uh, at this depth, not only in the news, uh, news business, but in the vetting of people who sometimes have access to rather sensitive circles. The amazing thing is that he was able to insinuate himself into making lots of money from defense contractors, as well as onto Fox News saying all the kinds of things that Hannity would like him to say. Unfortunately, if they get someone who's going to say the kinds of things that they want to hear, uh, I imagine the, the fact-checking is very cursory. The fact-checking on their facts <laughs> is very cursory. How's that? I, but just like I'd been here the whole time. No, anyway, uh, yeah, as usual, fact-checking is cursory at best. Well, um, now, you know the, the puppet that we put into power in Afghanistan, Hamid Karzai, uh, He's basically a, a yes man for for any American administration, but uh, he's kind of telling it the way it is a lot. He, I mean, he's walking a, a tightrope because he really does want to come out and go like this to the Americans, but he doesn't dare. Uh, he'll they'll take him out of power if they get that inkling that he's not 100% on our side. But uh, anyway, while we're doing, we're going to play this this clip from. Amid Karzai, and uh, wh while we're doing it, if you'd like to have one of these beyond misinformation, all you have to do is call in, and the next one, two, three, four, five people that call will be assigned a secret number, so you don't even have to give your name. You'll be assigned a secret number. You just come down to the front desk here and say, hi, I'm XYZ, and they'll hand it to you, Okay. That way, you don't. Even, all, that that covers all you paranoid people <laughs> that don't want to identify yourselves. All you have to do is just take the number we give you and come down, and we'll give you one of these magazines. The next five callers, and the number is. Oops, I guess I got to get out of the way. There it is. <laughs> the the number is right there. Five zero three two eight eight four 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 eight. And in the meantime, we're going to play the Hamid Karzai interview on RT. Go ahead. Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevardnadze. Having served as Afghanistan's leader for more than a decade, Hami Karzai remains a powerful political figure. With the Taliban gaining ground across the country, we ask him how Afghanistan can tackle growing radicalism and if he can cope with the terror threat on its own. Hamid Karzai is my guest today. 
Despite 14 years of combat, Afghanistan is far from being stable and peaceful. And the recent successes of the resurgent Taliban are foiling U.S. plans to withdraw. Can the extremist tide be overturned? Is Afghanistan capable of stopping it on its own? Or is the lasting American presence inevitable? His Excellency Hamid Karzai, the former president of Afghanistan, welcome to the show. It's great to have you back. Thank you, ma'am. Happy to be with you. Now, Mr. Karzai, for 14 years, the strongest armies in the world were fighting terrorism in your country. Yet, you've said there is more radicalism in Afghanistan today than ever before. How do you explain that? Well, unfortunately, yes, there is more radicalism uh, in Afghanistan and indeed in the whole region that there was ever before. And that is why um, uh, I've been calling for a long time now for a rethinking of the strategy uh, in the fight against terrorism, for re-evaluating whether uh, the struggle against terrorism is a failure or if there is uh, um, uh, a broader issue at hand here that we don't um, uh, know yet about or we don't understand. Therefore, um, uh, you're right, it's, it's very much uh, time, rather uh, long overdue, to reconsider the whole question and to find answers uh, together with uh, uh, major countries in this region, meaning uh, Russia, China, and India. In other words, the United States and its NATO allies must now begin to consult with major powers and explain. But how do you explain the phenomenon that I have cited in the beginning, that for such a long time, the greatest powers, the greatest military powers were trying to fight terrorism in Afghanistan, and yet they have failed? How is that even possible? Is it their failure? Well, well we must... For well, we must first find out if it, this has been a failure, but if this is not described as a, as a failure by the United States and its allies, then we need to have explanations from them on uh, what else is uh, the reason. Therefore, uh, we have questions too here uh, um, in Afghanistan and, and as, as, as uh, uh, people have questions around the world. Uh, there is no doubt that radicalism has increased. There's no doubt that, that extremism has increased. There's no doubt that suffering has increased, especially in Afghanistan and, and in the Middle East. Um, so we need answers and we need to uh, scratch our heads and, and explain. Now, we're seeing the Afghan Taliban launching its biggest offensive since they were toppled, briefly taking the city of Kunduz. How dangerous is their operation? Oh, that was... Uh, very unfortunate for the people of Kunduz and then uh, the suffering uh, uh, that, that followed for the civilians and the uh, bombing of the uh, Médecins Sans Frontières uh, Hospital. All of that uh, should bring us back to your first question on how come there is uh, an increase in radicalism and who is responsible for this. Uh, we know that such a large force uh, cannot ever get together and launch such a major operation against a major Afghan city without foreign backing. Now, if this foreign backing, as we suspect, came from Pakistan, then uh, uh, our allies, the United States, who are now um, uh, um, having uh, bases here, who have a bilateral security agreement with Afghanistan, in which uh, there is a clear reference to uh, uh, helping and defending Afghanistan if there is a foreign aggression against Afghanistan. That has to be then uh, looked at and uh, uh, explained both by the United States and uh, uh, by Afghans as well. Therefore, we need to explain to the Afghan people the fact of the matter. We are actually going to get to who is backing Taliban for it to be so strong at this point. But before we get there, I want to ask you something. Um, Your Excellency, we see the United States is praising the Afghan security forces. Uh, we see the Defense Ministry making such statements all the time, kind of exaggerating their work. Why are the Americans painting a rosy picture in Afghanistan when the reality is much more serious? Who are they trying to fool? The Afghan forces are, are no doubt heroic, 
No doubt they fight very well. No doubt they are trying to defend their country. But the Afghan forces are not properly equipped. They don't have the right, uh, the right um, uh, weaponry and the right um, uh, elements needed as far as the military training and, and all of that is concerned to provide a good defense of the country. But even uh, with a very strong force, uh, if there is a continued foreign intervention and if that intervention is uh, left unanswered for years, uh, you are going to get into a situation like we are in Afghanistan. This has been one of my, uh, one of my major issues with, with, uh, with the United States, with, with other allies. First, the training of the Afghan forces, the proper equipping of the Afghan forces, and then uh, addressing the question of sanctuaries beyond Afghanistan. As long as that continues, we will continue to suffer, meaning the sanctuaries abroad, and the helping hand abroad, as long as that continues, we will suffer. So when the Americans launch a bombing campaign to help Afghan forces fend off the Taliban offensive, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Is this efficient way to do things? Not at all. Uh, I have been from the very beginning against aerial bombardment of my country. Uh, and I have said repeatedly, and I will repeat myself again, that the war on terror is not in Afghan villages, it is not in Afghan cities, it is not, it is not in Afghanistan, that if we want to succeed against terrorism, we must go to the sanctuaries, we must go to the training grounds, we must go to those who finance them and support them. Unless we stop that, uh, we are only causing harm to civilians uh, in Afghanistan. Therefore, it is for this reason that I did not sign the bilateral security agreement with America, because this could not be explained to me in a manner that would satisfy me, that would satisfy me. So uh, for us, Afghanistan, the region and the international community, it is now time that we look into the whole 14 years of the war on terror in Afghanistan and beyond with a critical analysis, with finding truths and with finding those who are behind backing to extremists, wherever they may be in this region or beyond. Now, you mentioned the horrific accident uh, that took place just recently during the clashes in northern Afghanistan, where U.S. planes bombed at Doctors Without Borders, the MSF hospital. Now, the United States says the strike on the MSF hospital was a mistake. MSF says the exact coordinates of the facility were well known and regularly shared with the U.S. and Afghan forces. Why was this information ignored by the U.S. Air Force? I can't answer that. I don't know why this information was ignored. But I can tell you that the reason I banned uh, the use of Air Force in Afghan villages and towns and cities was because of the very clear fact that we all know uh, that such operations would inevitably cause harm to civilians because that's where the civilians are. So whether it was a mistake or not a mistake, whether it was deliberate or an accident, in any case, using an Air Force in cities and populated areas is wrong, definitely and without any doubt. Now, according to American press, the, proven. sure. According to American press, the government in Afghanistan is arming militias and local warlords to help stop the Taliban offensive. Is this going to work, in your opinion? No, no. I, I don't know if there is such a plan. I haven't heard of it. There was talk about it, but um, I have not seen any government decision in this regard. Uh, creating militias uh, is not a solution to uh, the difficulties in Afghanistan. The solution is in three clear areas, ma'am. One, that the United States and its allies must now begin to, if the war on terror is genuine, if that's exactly what they want, they must now begin to consult with major powers in this region, that is China, India, Russia. Two, they must focus on sanctuaries, on training grounds, on motivational factors, on schools and madrasas who are, who are uh, uh, providing training and sanctuary to, to extremists, and on those who provide them with the resources. 
whether those resources are provided in our neighborhood or beyond our neighborhood. Three, that the international community, the United States, and other allies in Afghanistan must begin to support Afghanistan strongly and effectively in the proper training and equipping of the Afghan forces and provide this country with proper infrastructure and economic support. But I also feel like inside Afghanistan, um, people are very much split. I read in New York Times a quote from a police chief from a city that was fending off the Taliban assault. And he said that it's easier to let the Taliban rule because the government is failing. What is the government doing so wrong to make people think like this? Well, there are individual opinions, of course, uh, all around us, uh, some uh, uh, in one direction, uh, others in another direction. Uh, I'm a former president of Afghanistan, and for me to publicly uh, 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 speak about my government is not right, uh, other than uh, in approving terms, other than making sure that the government functions and delivers well. All right. Your Excellency, we're going to take a short break right now. When we're back, we'll continue talking to the former president of Afghanistan, Hamid Karzai, discussing the possibility of continuing peace talks with the Taliban. Stay with us. Okay, we're going to uh, interrupt that interview right there. And if you're interested, you can go find more. But you see what he was saying about how when he was in power, he had to really watch what he said and he had to put everything positively about the administration but now that he's out of power he can be a little more truthful but you know the war that's never meant to end all right <laughs> we just had a visitor pop his head in and say hello and uh yeah while we were uh watching this video we had several callers call in and claim those pamphlets but we still have some left so check check out this number oops i keep moving the wrong way here it is 288 Four 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 eight, and uh, we'll be taking calls during this next video. And uh, you might like this next video also. This is uh, about the 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 Tesla, the the vehicle that downloaded its own software to turn itself into a <laughs> one of those uh, autopilot taxi cabs. Well, I, I don't think that's what they meant to do. But anyway, let, let's let's watch this. This is Infowars.com and uh, David Knight. Technology is always a two-edged sword. There's good aspects to it, there's bad aspects to it. I would be not opposed to self-driving cars in principle. I am opposed, however, when the CEO of Uber says that he's going to use it to end car ownership. Because I know that Uber is getting a pass, getting a double standard treatment that is highly favorable compared to what traditional taxi companies have been receiving in terms of government regulation, in terms of taxation, in terms of what they have to pay for a taxi medallion. You understand, as we shot that report talking to uh, taxi drivers in Washington, D.C., in New York, you have to pay half a million dollars for a taxi medallion. The Uber drivers aren't paying that. The Uber drivers are not having to get their cars inspected every six months. They don't have a special uh, enforcement arm of the police that is focused simply on taxi drivers that will basically give them massive fines if their car is even dirty. That's what we're told in Washington, D.C. That's what the taxi driver told us. I'm all for a free market, but what we have here is crony capitalism. You had companies that were called Jitney Taxi Companies. Uh, that were tried once upon a time. These were minority-owned taxi companies, the professional taxi companies, the unionized taxi companies, whatever you want to call them, the established taxi companies that had the business licenses would were reluctant to go into a lot of the minority communities because they thought it was too dangerous or the fares were not lucrative enough. And so people in minority communities who didn't have cars needed taxis. So a lot of entrepreneurs in the minority community started what they called Jitney Taxi Companies. These were unlicensed. They didn't have all of the uh, regulation that the regular taxi companies did. And they cracked down on them very hard. Because, you see, the government wanted to create this symbiotic relationship with the highly regulated taxi companies, with the unions and so forth and so on, to control it to get a large kickback. 
So they didn't want a free market, but now they're bending out of their way to establish a free market for Uber, giving them a, a, essentially a free market like they cracked down on the Jitney taxi companies. Why is that? Well, because Travis Kalalnik and Uber and these other companies, but especially Uber, is set up with the government. They are operating on the same page. They want to get rid of private ownership of car and uh, cars, and they understand that Uber is their way to do it. And, of course, Uber is going to get rid of that dude in the car with you. That's what he said. That's his words exactly. He says, once I do that, then my service is going to be incredibly cheap, and I will make private ownership of cars go away. They don't want you to have freedom of movement. They want, don't want you to have freedom of transportation. They want to control and track your movements. And they're going to do that even if you retain your ownership of your car. They're going to do that with the equipment that they put in your car. Because they're going to require that your car talks to all these other cars. We're only about a year or two away from mandated talking cars. And when I mean mandated talking cars, they're going to be talking to each other. It's called vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. And they're going to be communicating with each other. They're going to be communicating to listening stations. They're going to be communicating to the government and to your insurance company to tell them how you're driving. So they can increase the fines, increase the insurance fees to you. So they can basically price you out of a car. And say, so, you know, it's... You don't want any more of these fines, do you? We'll just uh, get rid of your car and you can drive around in an Uber taxi and then we will control all of your transportation. So that's where this is going. This is going to a control grid to track everything that you're doing. So that's why I don't like the technology. It isn't going to be presented as an option for you in the long term. It is going to be presented as a way to push you out of your car to take away your freedom of movement. I... I'm part of the generation, the post-World War II generation, that grew up seeing cars as the essence of individual freedom. You know, see the USA in your Chevrolet. There's Dinah Shore singing that. That's what I grew up with. That's what we experienced, the kind of freedom that comes from mobility, the freedom to live in the suburbs or the country if we want to and commute into the city. But, of course, the, the environmentalists don't like that. So you have to get rid of that. You're going to have to get rid of that car. We don't like the suburbs. We don't like urban sprawl. We don't like all these other factors. So we're going to take that choice away from you, but we're going to do it in the name of something that is benevolent. Well, it's not really that benevolent. As you may have heard with the news breaks that we did, well, there's been some issues with the self-driving updates that were done by Tesla. Tesla's the first one to actually put this out. Of course, the equipment is being put in all the cars now. They had all the equipment put in, the subsystems tested, uh, forward-looking radar and that sort of thing into their car system. So it was just a software update. They did it about a week ago. Now we've already had multiple instances of people putting up on the Internet places where this went crazy. And you can see that they're playing some B-roll right there of a, a Tesla car trying to... Yeah, the guy, as, as he's going along there, if you hear the audio, it's going... Beep, 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 and the car is coming towards him, and the car jerks the wheel into the path of the oncoming car, but he grabs it and pulls it back. Yeah, let's play the audio on that so people can hear that on the radio. Go ahead. I just want to pop up to show up and say brace for impact. <laughs> oh, this is great. Great technology. He's driving along, enjoying this technology. So it's good on the highway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Now that's that's a that's a reporter, and isn't that great? Now that's not the guy that just had the uh, car try to throw him in the path of the oncoming vehicle. But as they point on, Tesla comes back and says the latest autopilot release is a hands-on experience to give drivers more confidence behind the wheel, to increase their safety on the road, to make motorway driving more enjoyable. Now look at this, and I go, Are you kidding me? Are the people driving these $70,000 to $100,000 automobiles, are these student drivers? Uh, do they need more hands-on experience to drive down the road on the highway? Come on. <laughs> that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. The other thing that's ridiculous about this is that Tesla says that uh, this is a beta release and use it at your own risk. And if you have an accident, uh, you're responsible, not us. Let me tell you something. Data releases for software are one thing where you crash and lose your data. But, you know, this is, we're talking about people's lives here being at stake. I think they're going to have some criminal liability if they crash this thing. But just as uh, Anthony Gucciardi pointed out earlier, there's this MIT technology review talking yet again. And this just came out yesterday. Why self-driving cars must be programmed to kill. Yeah. 
We need to solve an impossible ethical dilemma of algorithmic morality. Algorithmic morality. Computer morality. We have abdicated so many things to computers now. Why not abdicate our morality, our choice? And see, that goes back to what we were talking about in the first hour about CISA just passed in the Senate and it's already passed in the House. And, of course, Obama is going to sign it. When they turn that information over to the government, you're going to have an algorithm that is going to flag you as a terrorist, send out a SWAT team, possibly start a prosecution of you. You're turning everything over to our computers, to the government, and we don't have any freedom that we're restraining for ourselves. But, of course, everybody in the tech business is cheering this on. Look at the way Wired Magazine uh, puts this out. Their headline, obviously, drivers are already abusing Tesla's autopilot. So you see, it's, it's not that it's a bad idea. It's not that you shouldn't be beta testing stuff on the streets with human drivers. No, it's the drivers who are abusing the software program. Poor software program. Poor Tesla. Isn't that a shame? And, of course, <laughs> one of these people in Miami... Uh, took a video. He says that his auto self-driving car was driving 75 in a 60-mile-an-hour zone, and he was pulled over by the Florida Highway Patrol, and he showed the speeding tickets that he got. Well, they're going to be giving you speeding tickets all the time because they're going to have the black box recorders. They're going to have the V2V communication, and they're going to be passing that information on to the Highway Patrol. Of course, they won't need Highway Patrol anymore, but they're going to be passing that information on. Now, I want to just go back and recall an older article that was out, uh, it was in 2015, it was earlier this year, talking about researchers hacking the same model car. But of course, they said, don't worry, this is also Wired Magazine, don't worry, Tesla's already patched that vulnerability. Well, as long as you've got the capability of a computer driving your car, as long as you've got all these systems that were there, and of course... What did they do? They, they hacked a Tesla Model S because it's got all the controls built in there so that you can drive the car, as we just saw with their most recent update. So you can get an update that makes the car uh, a self-driving autonomous car, or you can get an update from a hacker that drives you anywhere they want, off the cliff, into the side of a mountain, whatever. You know, when we talked about this with Michael Hastings, everybody said, you crazy conspiracy theorists, nobody could or would do that. Well, it's that wasn't that long ago. That was only a couple of years ago. That was 2013 that Michael Hastings died. And we said, you know, he was being investigated. We didn't even know at the time. It was, it was ridiculous the way they were uh, talking about how the engine had been ejected at a right angle when he crashed into a tree. They told us he was driving 100 miles an hour, but everybody that knew him said he drove like a granny, and then it came out that he was being investigated uh, by the FBI. Of course, we knew that he had made enemies within the military community when he was doing reporting, but uh, we knew that uh, we learned that he was doing an investigation. He was on the run. He told all of his friends, I need to disappear for a while, and then we see that car crash that happened. And quite frankly, I don't think that the car blew up when it hit the tree either. I think there was multiple things involved, in my opinion. Somebody was making that car drive 100 miles an hour, and I think that there was a detonation of a bomb that caused that engine to continue down the same path it was, and then the car came to a relatively gentle rest against a tree. The gas tank was never involved. It, you can see the pictures of it. It wasn't uh, burning from there. It was burning from where he was. And it didn't smash into a car. There's just a, an article a week or two ago. The same model Mercedes, a couple of teenagers were out driving. They hit a tree. It cut their car in half. That didn't happen with Michael Hastings. That's the potential for abuse. Yet another example of how if you give this kind of power to the government, to corporations, it can be abused by evil people. The Global Association. Well, welcome back. We're going to be uh, giving away more of these magazines. And as you can see, oh, there I go, backwards again. I need to get the reverse image like the weather people have. But it's 288-444-8888. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's the uh, Studio B. So we still have a couple of these magazines left. If you'd like to call up and claim one, 
In the meantime, uh, since we're talking about 9-11, let's uh, play a, a little short clip, a six-minute clip. This is with uh, David Chandler, and he's talking about the absence of the pile driver. Remember, they keep talking about the top part of that building crushing the bottom part? Didn't happen. Watch this video. Here is a diagram of the structure of the Twin Towers. The, both towers are essentially like this. They could be thought of as a building within a building. Notice the core structure and a perimeter structure. This is what it really looked like. That core structure had members like that. This is not little spaghetti strands that are going up the center of the building. This is a very substantial uh, core structure. By pulling the core columns to the center to form this integral interior, they were able to leave a lot of floor space uh, usable. That was the attraction of this design. This is a hat truss at the top that ties the tops of the columns together and uh, helps to share the load. And then these are the floors. And then there's uh, floor structures underneath. There are uh, girders under here that, I guess you call them trusses under there that support the floors. These are what the perimeter columns are like. They're three stories at a time in these wall units. So this one that's being hauled up over here is three stories tall, 14 inch square box columns, about a meter apart. And uh, each one of these is about I think about four tons. They vary depending on how high they were in the building. This claim that the upper section of each of the towers crushed the lower section. The top section pushing on the bottom section it's going to meet equal forces as it goes. Both sections are going to be uh, demolished at the same rate. So by the time you've crushed up 15 stories below it, the top 15 stories are also going to be crushed. And so there's nothing left now to crush the rest of the building. Something of this kind is what we should have seen when the top section of the towers collapsed onto the lower one. The upper and lower sections should have mutually destroyed each other until all the energy is dissipated and the system comes to a rest. What could not have happened is this. A little tiny chunk of the building can't possibly fall and crush the entire structure below it. This is high school physics and our whole society is being led to believe that these fundamental laws of physics, hard science, don't apply anymore. The area below the damage zone where the planes flew in and where the fire was, that area below that, those 80 or 90 stories, 80,000 tons of structural steel was not damaged in any way. Yet you stood there and watched it destroy itself wiping out floor by floor all 287 structural columns as if they didn't exist underneath the uh, damage zone. You're looking for a jolt, that this thing, if it actually comes down and hits, you should be able to see the point at which they actually impact because it would actually slow down the motion of the falling block. It never slows down. It accelerates the entire time. And that was what was extremely significant. So I published a paper about that. It's in the Journal of 9-11 Studies. And so if you had the top section acting like a pile driver, if, if in fact it actually hit and made an impact, it was effectively crushing anything, pushing hard on this core structure below it, the core structure is going to push back equally hard, and that's what's going to cause the top section of the building to slow down. But here you have this block continuing to pick up speed. It's not slowing down, it's speeding up. And the only way that can happen is to say, it is not crushing the bottom section of the building. The bottom section is being removed to allow this to fall into oblivion. This is falling into the, the, the hole, basically, that's been opened up for it. 
the rate of fall is not free fall. That's, um, you might have heard that occasionally. A lot of people talk about how it's free fall or close to free fall. Yeah, it's two thirds of free fall if you actually measure it. It's falling at two thirds of the acceleration of gravity. I just put a little reversing thing there. Notice what's really crushing here. Do you notice uh, anything happening at this level? Fire. Yeah, but is it moving down the building? No. Do you see a block here crushing down this lower block? Yeah. All I see is a block here that's basically halfway destroyed already before it has even started to move down the building. But notice the mass coming down, which means the core columns have all been cut or destroyed by some mechanism. And notice that the roof line is horizontal. And notice that this entire thing is collapsing like an accordion. And that's observationally what's going on. So you don't have a block that's going to even survive this initial uh, period here to crush down the rest of the building, even if it could. Okay, uh, if you'd like a copy of this, call in during this next clip. This, this next clip we're going to have is uh, uh, Norman Finkelstein talking about the latest infa, infa, infada, into, intifada, intifada. <laughs> okay, the latest Israeli Palestinian. Uh, devastation, I guess I should say. The Israelis are at it again, folks. So go ahead and play that, and I'll see you next week. In the meantime, 288-4448 will get you a copy of this. Call now. You made an interesting point mm -hmm. about how the West Bank and Gaza, do, they don't even have the tools. It seems to me, I don't want to mm -hmm. put words in your mouth, but it seems to me that you were basically saying that they don't even have the tools for a third intifada. No, I don't agree with that, uh -huh. because we see glimmers of hope, a glimmer of hope. We see in, in Gaza now, there are mass demonstrations of people non-violently going to the fence that separates Gaza from Israel and trying to break down the fence to end the siege. Luckily, Hamas is staying out of it because Hamas is afraid if they're seen to be leading these demonstrations or they fire rock, uh, so-called rockets in retaliation for the killings of demonstrators, Israel will have a new Operation Protective Edge. So they're staying away, but they're not repressing it. They're not blocking the demonstrations. If these demonstrations, these mass demonstrations, nonviolent, if two other conditions are met, two other conditions are met, there is hope. Condition number one, they have to convey clearly, unmistakably, unequivocally, our goal is to end the siege of Gaza. We're not trying to overrun Israel. We're not trying to invade Israel. We're not trying to swamp Israel. We just want to end the siege. We want the law to be enforced. The law says the siege is illegal. It's collective punishment. The United Nations Human Rights Commission, in its last report on Gaza, it said, and I'm quoting it, it said the, the blockade of Gaza, the siege, has to be lifted immediately and unconditionally. Every one of your viewers should commit those words to their memory immediately and unconditionally. It says nothing about we have to make sure Hamas doesn't use the cement to make uh, tunnels. We have to make sure Hamas doesn't sm smuggle in weapons. It doesn't say that. It says immediately and unconditionally. So some people may say, well, what do you expect from the UN Human Rights Council? Well, remember. That particular commission was chaired by Mary McGowan Davis. She is a New York State judge. New York State judge. Not a third world judge or a 
anti-Semitic judge, New York, and she said, and the report said, it has to be lifted immediately and unconditionally. If they continue to be nonviolent, if they make clear all we want is to see the law enforced, that's all we're asking. And the third condition is us here. On their own, they can't do it for just the reason you said. They don't have the tools. They don't have the access. They're not able to communicate with the public in the West and say, all we're asking is to end that illegal, inhuman, immoral siege. That's our job. We have to convey to the public the legitimacy, the elementary, the basic legitimacy of what they're asking. And we have to rise to the occasion. If they are willing to risk their lives, which they're doing, the last time Israel shot down, I guess, seven Gazans who were nonviolently demonstrating, we have to, if they're willing to risk their lives, then we have to be willing to put our bodies on the line. And you know and I know in the West, that doesn't mean you're going to get shot. What it simply means is, we have to close down the United Nations in New York, and we have to close it down in Geneva. And we have to do the nonviolent civil resistance here with one demand. United Nations, enforce your law. The law wasn't made by the Palestinians. That's the international law that you are supposed to be enforcing. Enforce your law. Your own UN Human Rights Commission said that blockade, that immoral, illegal, inhuman blockade that's now gone on for 10 years, a 10 year long blockade. It's illegal, it's time to end the blockade. That's the law, that's your law. And if they can manage, if they find the strength, if they find a moral wherewithal, to stay nonviolent, if they communicate clearly, this is not about invading Israel. It's about giving us space to breathe. For 10 years, you have suffocated us in this blockade. It's about enforcing the law. And if we do our job here, because I agree with you, they don't have the tools on their own. It's a small people. It's four million people. It's the size of Brooklyn. And the infrastructure has certainly changed. But on that note, I, I, I do mm -hmm. hear you. But you know, you're also one to deplore the violence mm -hmm. of the Israelis on the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. What about the violence that's put upon the Israelis look, by the Palestinians? Look, I have studied international law. In fact, I taught it in Turkey this past academic year. And I taught the laws of war. There's a lot in international law that I don't, I don't agree with. It doesn't make any sense to me. But now is not the time or place for a seminar on international law, on international humanitarian law, what's called the laws of war. The basic point is this. You can't expect Palestinians to act according to the law if the other side gets to get away with murder. That doesn't make any sense to me. If Israelis can carry on with impunity, no punishment when they carry out these massacres, these periodic massacres of the Palestinians, or in the West Bank when a family is incinerated and nobody's charged with any crime then how can you expect the Palestinians to quote-unquote obey the law when the other side gets away with murder? That to me is an unrealistic and actually an immoral expectation to place on the Palestinians. Now, as my co-author Jamie Stern Weiner, as he said, he keeps reminding me when I get a little bit under the hot under the collar on this issue. He says you have to remember the main beneficiaries of the law are oppressed people, not the oppressor. 
Israel killed 550 children in Gaza during Operation Protective Edge. The Palestinians killed one Israeli child. Ratio, you can figure that one out, even if you didn't take calculus in high school, 555 to 1. Israel destroyed 19,000, 19,000 Palestinian homes in Gaza during Operation Protective Edge. Hamas destroyed one Israeli home, one. Again, you don't need rocket science to figure out the ratio, 19,000 to one. So if the law were enforced, obviously the main beneficiary would be the Palestinians because they are the overwhelming losers from the lawlessness. They are the ones who lose from the lawlessness. They're the ones who lost 550 children, 19,000 homes. Israel loses one child and one home. With that said, right. you just described Israel as being extremely powerful. Right. I want right. uh, to, just to right. complete the thought, but you cannot expect or put the burden on Palestinians to act according to the law in what my other co-author, Muin Rabani, calls a zone of lawlessness. Israel has carved out a zone of lawlessness. And then you can't expect Palestinians to act according to the law in a zone of lawlessness. And it's everyone, everyone is guilty in enabling Israel to carry on in a lawless fashion. The UN Human Rights Council report, which I mentioned to you earlier, Amnesty International, all of them in their reports in Operation Protective Edge, they all said that Israel was not targeting Palestinian civilians during Operation Protective Edge. That's a scandal, that's a scandal as a general statement. It's doubly a scandal because if you read the reports, and I read them with great care, all of their own evidence, I'm not talking about Palestinian evidence, I'm not talking about my evidence, all of their evidence showed that Israel was targeting civilians. So they accumulate all this evidence and then they proceed to conclude that Israel was not targeting civilians. So they are aiding and abetting Israel as it carves out this zone of lawlessness. So I say, if you don't want those knifings and other assaults by Palestinians, then enforce the law and show the Palestinians by example that if you obey the law, we'll force Israel to obey the law. But if Israel doesn't have the, oh, to obey the law, if you're going to lie and lie and lie, as the United Nations Human Rights Council did, and as Amnesty International did, if you're going to lie and lie and lie, if you're going to rub salt in the wound, and after they target us, you're going to produce these reports, publish these reports, which say they weren't targeting us. When ambulances were going into war zones, do you know the courage it takes? The ambulances would go into war zones in Gaza, in Rafa, in, uh, um, the place just uh, slips my mind, in Rafa and, and elsewhere. They went into the war zones. One ambulance, Israel sends the missiles, blows it up, incinerates, incinerates eight people in the ambulance. They were just all charred ash. Then 
a second ambulance comes. I'm not making the stories up. I'm telling you what the reports showed. They fired the missiles of the second ambulance and then a third ambulance. After you're firing the missiles at the ambulances, the sirens are going, they're all marked. They're all marked as ambulances. And Israel doesn't even pretend that they weren't ambulances. They didn't even bother to produce any evidence except one silly tape, which was absolutely worthless. And then after that, you conclude Israel wasn't targeting civilians. You know what an insult that is to the memory of the dead and the torment of the living? And in the face of that, you want Palestinians to respect the law. You spat on the law. You're responsible for every knifing that goes on in the occupied territories. You created the conditions. You think they're monsters? You're Frankenstein. You created the monsters. It doesn't seem that going along with the lawlessness and stepping back and sort of, it doesn't seem that going along with the lawlessness is helping the Palestinian I listen, cause. Mona, a, Mona, you're Palestinian, you're a mother. And I know you're speaking from your heart now. Just like you want for your child to have a decent life, not to grow up among death, destruction, and so forth. And there's a natural pacifistic impulse in you as a mother. Of course, I totally agree with you. I said a few moments ago, it's not going to work because you're going to lose the international community. And it's much easier to control knifings than it is to control mass nonviolent civil disobedience. I, I'm not, I never, my credo in life is I never quarrel with facts. Of course what you're saying is true. But there seems to be this kind of precondition for engaging in any conversation regarding what's going on there. You have to begin by deploring the Palestinian violence. I will not begin by deploring the Palestinian violence. I begin by deploring what has been done to those people. I begin by deploring that. And then from there, OK, let's move on. But let's be clear who created that situation. And I include in that the United Nations Human Rights Council, I include in that Amnesty International, all of these cowards. They're cowards. They're afraid of offending Israel because it may hurt their professional advancement. You know, I had a correspondence with Amnesty International. And they say, we start from the assumption. We start in all of our reports. We start from the assumption that if Israel is using precision weapons, it would never target civilians. Is that a fact? That's what they said, yeah. I have it in writing. And then they go on to say, even if we find no evidence, even if we find no evidence that they were targeting a military objective, we still have to, and this is their phrase, entertain the possibility that they were. <laughs> Even if they have no evidence, they still have to entertain the possibility that Israel, well, if that's your standard, Israel would never target civilians, then why aren't you working for the Israeli foreign ministry? Why are you working for Amnesty International? Are you going to tell me that when those four children we're playing hide and seek in Gaza. And when they were playing it near an old fisherman's dilapidated hut, and they were children of diminutive size, and Israel, which has every square inch of Gaza under its um, surveillance, you're going to tell me that when they killed those four children, 
They mistook them for Hamas militants, and they mistook the dilapidated fisherman's hut for a Hamas control center. And you're going to tell me that all the international journalists were wrong when they were sitting there and they said it was a clear case of targeting four children. But the amnesty standard now is if Israel uses precision weapons, it can't be targeting civilians. And the UN Human Rights Council was just as deplorable, point by point, wretched point by wretched point, to the point that my innards were writhing, twisting. When I was reading these reports at night, I was like calling up all my friends, you gotta hear this, you gotta hear this. They were laughing, laughing hysterically. Israel's targeting children, and you know what the UN Human Rights Council report concludes? I'm not kidding. It says, Israel did not take sufficient precautions to protect civilians in the course of its military attack. Sufficient precautions? They were targeting them, you idiot. That's what your evidence shows. They didn't take sufficient precautions to protect them when they were launching a military attack. Excuse me, where was the military objective? The four children? The hut? I mean, it's so laughable. And then to tell the Palestinians, you know, behave, act according to the law. Do you have any hope for what um, the UN can do, what Amnesty can do, no, what Israel can I, do? I'm a, I, I have no, I have no, I take no offense at religious people. I believe that everybody has the entitlement to his or her spirituality. I'm an, uh, an atheist, it's the family I was, grown, I was brought up in, and that's how I'll die. But as a resolute atheist, I still believe God helps those who help themselves. It depends on us. It depends on you, your husband, your family. It depends on me. It depends on ordinary people who have an ordinary, uneducated sense of right and wrong. And the hope is, if you can convey to people the reality, the truth, that maybe you can get them to act. And if you can get